Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and today I want to start something new with you. In addition to the regular sermons that I preach and post on this channel, which I'm going to continue to do, the one thing about preaching through the these books of the Bible that I normally preach through is that I will most likely never be able to preach through the entire Bible that way. I've chosen the books that I have specifically uh, for different purposes and different reasons, and, and one of the main reasons is that they interest me. The subject matter in the books that I am preaching through um, have piqued my interest, um, and that I want to not just try to teach those books, but actually preach through those books, and, and so I've been doing that regularly now. But I want to start something new today. I call it an inductive journey series, or the inductive journey series, something like that. And what I want to do with this is it would be my hope that even though I can't preach through every book of the Bible, that I could teach you through every book of the Bible, that I could explain the text in, in a maybe a more broader way, but give you an explanation of the text more in a teaching fashion and, and be able to systematically walk through the books of the Bible and so I want to begin with Genesis and then move to Exodus and then Leviticus and then, you know, continue to move through the books. And, and my plan is, is to make these lessons uh, go between 25 to 35 minutes. Um, this one may go a little bit longer because I'm trying to introduce the series. But, um, but take you on a journey, an inductive journey through the Bible. And the way this will work is I will take it section by section, go through the books of the Bible, uh, but there have been others previously, I'm not the first to do something like this, there have been others previously, like uh, J. Vernon McGee, Through the Bible, uh, had a program called Through the Bible, and it took him five years. And I'm envisioning it could be a five to six, seven year process of going through this, and, and some of the books, like the book of Isaiah that I'm preaching through, is going to take about that long, uh, the way I'm mapping it out. And so um, so this is a process. As you know, I also have a devotional that I'm working on. That's a five-year journey. Uh, I'm also working on curriculum for training pastors, and that just comes as it comes. Um, and I'm working on that. So I have a lot of things that I'm working on. But I've always wanted to teach through the Bible and study through the Bible just for my own self. And so I want to share that journey with you as you're able to watch. And we'll take this in order. We'll go through chapter order. And um, today, I just want to introduce the book of Genesis to us, give you kind of a, a basic overview of the book. So again, this is not going to be preaching sermons, and this is going to be more of a teaching nature and again, keep these to 25 to 35 minutes overall and, and, and take them in bite-sized chunks. Because what I'm hoping is that you would, um, if you would desire to learn the Bible like this as well, besides going through maybe some of the sermons, is that you would systematically learn the scriptures and be aware of them. And so that's, that's my hope. I am going to use the New Living Translation. That's the same passage that I've been using to preach from. And uh, sometimes when I'm in an actual church, I use whatever the translation that the church recommends, and uh, be it King James, ESV. But for the, for the channel, I've been using the New Living Translation just for the ease of the English language, especially maybe there are some who are watching this from other countries, and English is not their primary language, and, um, and so they may be able to understand a little bit better reading the New Living Translation in the, in the descriptions, the YouTube descriptions for each of these uh, teaching lessons uh, through this inductive journey series, you're going to find um, uh, links so that you can show uh, view documents that I am working through. Basically, I purchased for myself uh, the New Living Translation in eight and a half by 11 sheets, and it's got a whole, uh, three ring binder, and so it's the loose leaf pages, so it gives me plenty of space to write my notes, and maybe I can put a link in the description. Uh, it does cost money. That is not free. Um, I had to purchase that, and so I'm using that as a help to me 
uh, to be able to write my notes. And so I'll take, you know, pictures of that and you can see my notes uh, available. And then I have extra sheets of paper where I'm writing things out, other passages, other references, those kinds of things. So you can see that as we go. And, and so that'll be similar to the way I do my sermons uh, where notes are available uh, for that. And so anyway, that's kind of what I want to do and get started with this. And so we're going to start with the book of Genesis. We're going to begin there. And, and so as, it, as you would think, Genesis is the book of the beginnings. It's where everything starts, right? It's where we find out about the creation of the world. We find about find out about God creating every creature, God creating humanity. Um, and so there's in here that we've got the first marriage. We also have the first sin with Adam and Eve. We'll get to that when we get to chapter three. The consequences of that sin, which begin to you, you starts in chapter three, going into chapter four, and it continues. Uh, there's going to be the stories of the flood, right? The Tower of Babel. And then the then we're going to see the birth of the nation of Israel through the lineage of Abraham and how God will make a covenant through Abraham is, is what we're going to see. So this is the book of the beginnings. That's what this book is. It's the book of the beginnings. And, and, and what we're going to see is going to be, in a sense, revolutionary. It's going to help us to have a framework to understand the rest of the Bible. And so it's going to be very important that we pay attention to what we learn, pay attention to what we what we see here on the printed page. And so there's various aspects you need to understand about Genesis. And that's what I want to use this introductory time to, to, to discuss. I want to talk about the structure or the flow of the book to give you an idea of how the book is laid out structurally. Moses is the author. Moses wrote, um, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the first five books, right, of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, uh, the Torah, and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so we're going to go through those five books. We're going to go through them in order and starting here with Genesis. But when, it, when you look at just Genesis, there's a structure to it. There's a structure to it that's built into the text itself. And it becomes the best way to outline the book, to be honest. And this is the outline we're going to follow um, through the book as we walk through it or as we go through it. This will be the outline we walk through. And now I have it written down. You can look at it when you see the uh, screenshot or see the image of the picture that I take. But the flow of it kind of goes like this. I want to uh, show you something. If you... I want you to go to chapter 2, verse 4, and take a look at something. In chapter 2, verse 4, it says these words. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. You see that, that kind of formulaic kind of an expression? The word account is the key word that I want you to pick up on, uh, the word account. Then, the next time that shows up, is chapter 5, verse 1. It says, this is the written account of the descendants of Abraham. Chapter 5, verse 1. And then the next time it occurs is chapter 6, verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. See that? Chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, and then one more I'll show you. Chapter 10, verse 1, says this is the account of the families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What you see in the book of Genesis is this word account, A-C-C-O-U-N-T. In the Hebrew, it's called toledot. The expression is just one word in Hebrew, but it becomes an expression of in, in English when we translate it, this is the account of. It's that phrase, this is the account of. And so it's the idea of, of this thing called toledot. It's the Hebrew word. So the, the toledot, it represents like a structural element um, that, that, that connects all the different sections together as you walk through the book. So there's, there's a, a section that begins 
chapter 2, verse 4, that goes to chapter 4, verse 26. And then the next Holy Dote, chapter 5, verse 1, to chapter 6, verse 8. Uh, the next Holy Dote, chapter 6, verse 9, to chapter 9, verse 29. And then it starts in chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 10, chapter 11, verse 27, chapter 25, verse 12, chapter 25, verse 19, chapter 36, verse 1, and then chapter 36, verse 9, and then chapter 37, verse 2. And that, that Toledot introduces the last section, which goes from chapter 37, verse 2, all the way to chapter 50. So some of these Toledot sections are very small. Some of them are large in terms of the, the amount of textual content, the amount of verses that are included with each in, within each one. So the Tole Dote is, um, is a type of, of structural element. Now, when you look at the outline on the page, it's, uh, you're going to see that the way I've done this is laid this out is each of the Tole Dote phrases has a subject to it. For example, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, it's the creation right? It's, this is the account, it says, of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then you have in chapter 5, verse 1, the account of Adam. Chapter 6, verse 9, the account of Noah. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1, the sons of Noah. Uh, chapter 11, verse 10, Shem. Uh, 11, chapter 11, verse 27, Terah. Chapter 25, verse 12 is Ishmael. Chapter 25, verse 19, Isaac, and so on. You have Esau, sons of Esau, and then chapter 37, verse 2 is Jacob, going all the way to the end of the chapter, or into the book, sorry. And so there's this flow, there's this structure. Now, some would say, okay, if you have these designations, the Tole Dote of the creation, the Tole Dote of Adam, then that means that should be the main subject matter of that structure, that section of Genesis. Not necessarily. They're, they're, they're not the central character. If you actually look in chapter 5, verse 1, to chapter 6, verse 8, Adam is not the central character. Now, Noah, in chapter 6, verse 9, to chapter 9, verse 29, yeah, it does become a central character. But it, it doesn't work that way in all cases. It's the meaning of the word toledote that you have to be concerned about or that you have to understand. The word totally dote means technically when we say this is the account of, that's the literal translation of it, but it's this is what came of or this is where whatever that is started from. It's not to be limited to um, to the idea of a strict genealogy, even though some of these Toledotes are really like genealogies, and we'll see that as we go through. But the, the, the structural element is this. The structural flow is that you start with creation, chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 3. And there's no Toledote here. There's no written statement. It doesn't say at the beginning of chapter 1, verse 1, this is the account of. You don't get that. You actually just get the account of creation itself. You get the story of the creation narrative itself. And then you, it says, this is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And it goes to something else. And so the idea of totally dope, based on the meaning of the word itself and what's actually happening in Genesis, is that it's showing you the results of or the implications of. In other words, it introduces a concept. It introduces a story. It introduces some truth, some historical viable truth. In, in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 3, it's creation, it's, it creation itself, the creation narrative. Then it starts, when it goes to the next section, okay, what, what happened as a result of that? What was the next step that needed to take place? And so this, this, this totally dote is the way in which Moses showed the logical structure of the development of the book so that the people of Israel could read and understand it. It's, it's this, it was the structural mechanism inherent within the text to allow the people of Israel, the nation of Israel that he's leading out of Egypt, as we'll learn of in the book of Exodus, to, uh, uh, to help them to understand the origins of everything. 
to understand how God created everything, how everything came into existence. And so that's what you have here. The word totally dote shows up again in a couple of places. In Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, it says this is the genealogical record of their ancestors. And then you have that genealogical uh, list that shows up at the end of the book of Ruth. So it can be connected to a genealogy, but no, again, not in all cases, as we will see in the book of, uh, of Genesis. Um, in Numbers uh, chapter 3, verse 1, this is the family line of Aaron and Moses as it was recorded when the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. So there it's translated by the word family line, but it's the same kind of same kind of idea, same kind of wording is used. You, you actually see, even though the New Testament's written in Greek, if you go back and look at what's called the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and that was written and translated put together before the time of Christ. Um, if you go back and look at how they translate the Toledot and what Greek word represents that, then that same Greek word shows up in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, when it says, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah. And then there's another genealogical list there. So this word is connected sometimes to that. That's why maybe in the translation you're using it, the word genealogy is, is mentioned. That's the wording that's used. But it doesn't mean it's connected directly to a genealogy or genealogical list. And, and the way it's used in the book of, of book of Genesis, it shows up to try to take one narrative account and then link it to the next one, and then link it to the next one. So there's implications. There's always a cause and effect, you could say. One thing leads to the next. It leads to the next. That keeps the progression of the story along as God would want them to know it, the people of Israel who were the original audience of this. So the way I've described it, the way I've listed out the, the flow, is you have creation, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 3, but then you have the succession from creation. What happens after? What comes after? So it started with creation. What's, what, what else do we need to know from that? What are the implications of that? Or what comes next? It, it, it depends on what the content of the actual and the context of the actual section would be. But um, so you have a succession from creation, starting at chapter 2, verse 4. Succession from Adam, starting at chapter 5, verse 1. Succession from Noah, chapter 6, verse 9. Succession from the sons of Noah, chapter 10, verse 1, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so we'll use this as a flow of understanding the book. And so every time we get to a new section, uh, uh, we'll make sure, we'll, you will realize that we're entering another section into the book as we go through it. Now, some would ask, what is the purpose of the book? Why was Genesis um, written? Basically, what you have is you cannot disconnect this book. You cannot d disconnect this book from the other four books. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's a Pentateuch. Uh, the Jews understood that. That's why it's called the Torah, the book of the law. But uh, there's one author that connects them. But what you have here is in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's, it's, the main story is going to be about the, the establishment of the nation of Israel and God providing a covenant law uh, or making a covenant with the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, as they come out of Egypt and how he gives them his law and what all that represents. So as we go through Exodus, Leviticus, and so on, we're going to look at all that as we go through it. But you've got to have a beginning. 
And that's what the that's what the book of Genesis is. It is the historical account of the beginning of how not only did God create the world and how mankind for sins and 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 all of that that we will be looking at, but it's the historical basis is, basis for for God's covenant with Israel that he will establish with them in the other books of the Pentateuch. That's what you have here. It's the framework of that. It's the basis of that. It's the foundation of that. Here you meet Abraham. You meet his descendants, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Joseph. You, you meet the, the 12 tribes um, as they are born. You see these uh, sons as they are born. And, and you, you see all of this take place in the narrative and, and through the narrative of the, of the book of Genesis. And that gets you to the point where when the people of Israel are coming out of Egypt, they need to know their history. And God reveals to Moses everything they need to know. And so this is where everything begins. We also see the basis for mankind's problem. How sin enters this world. We'll look at that when we get to chapter 3. And how God was going to bring about a solution through the seed of the woman that would be connected with the establishment of the Abrahamic covenant. That would be how God is going to solve the problem of mankind's sinfulness. So that's what we're going to see in this book. We're going to be exposed to all of that. And we're going to take it section by section by section, we're going to walk our way through the book. But what you're going to see is that God has a solution to mankind's problem. And as I've told you, this book is the first book of five. So there, 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 so there is a great connection that we cannot um, miss. And so um, just to give you to show you a connection between the books, um, Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, at the end of the book, Genesis chapter um, 50, verse 24, uh, Joseph told his brother, soon I will die, but God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So here's a promise, like a, really, a, a, well, a prediction that God is going to fulfill his promise and bring the nation back. And then you go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. It says, well, starting at verse 23, years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. It was time to fulfill that promise and bring the nation back to the promised land. And so then you go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, um, verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph. This is when they're leaving. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear to do this. He said, God will certainly come to help you. And when he does, you must take my bones with you from this place. And so it's an interesting journey that's about ready to happen. In the life of the nation of Israel, it's recorded in the book of Exodus. But it's an interesting journey that we're going to begin just in the book of Genesis. Because God's going to show us how he's going to save the world. <laughs> we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to understand that, there, that he makes a covenant with Abraham and, and what all that means and how, how all that works. And so as we go through this inductive journey, you will see that. Now, let me give you some ways in which this book has been interpreted. 
Not everybody has interpreted it the same way. Some have said, well, it's myths, a myth or a fable. That Genesis 1 to 11, especially, none of that actually could have happened. It didn't happen the way it says it happened. This is not true historical data here or content. This is a myth. It's a fable. It's meant to be looked at allegorically. It cannot be true, can it? As it is stated? Oh, yes, it can. This is not a myth. This is not a fable. It's not just history. It's much more than that. Definitely not a myth or a fable for sure. This is true. This, these events took place. It is history, but it's more than that as well. It is theological truth in narrative form. Theological truth in narrative form. That's the way all narrative is, actually. Um, if you take the course on narrative genre that I'm offering, uh, and you understand how to interpret narrative genre, uh, narrative type of literature, that, that's what that is. Narrative is theological truth, but put within a story form. And so these are historical accounts that take place that really did happen, in like for the Gospels. What Jesus says, he said. But there, but there's also meaning behind that. There's a reason behind that. There's a purpose behind all of this. And so you want to be aware of that. Those who would have wanted to interpret this as just a myth or a fable, that it truly did not happen as it is recorded, they're just, they're totally on left in left field. They're totally on a different plane here. They're not seeing the book. They're not seeing the Bible. They probably do not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, uh, the perspicuity of Scripture. They don't believe in any of that stuff. They don't believe in any of the truth. And so they made up a decision. They come up to a, their own conclusion stating that they do not buy into the reliability of the narrative of Genesis. And, and so, so they still have to read it and deal with it. And they try to maybe allegorize it or some come up with some kind of psychological analysis of the whole thing. But the reality is it is true. It, 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 it did happen this way. And you, we need to understand that. So delving into that theology, th there's a presupposition here by, by, the, by, by the author, Moses, by Moses himself, because God dictated to him through the inspiration of the Spirit what to write. And there's a presupposition here that God does exist. And he has revealed himself. In words, on the page, to everyone. The Bible is the Bible. And so the book of Genesis begins with that presupposition. If you don't want to buy into that, if you don't want to believe that, then you're going to have a hard time, a difficult time, understanding the truths that are clearly written on the page. The theme of the book is God's work in establishing Israel as a means of blessing the world. Why? Because as we're going to see, the world falls into depravity, sin enters into this world, and the Savior is needed, and God has a plan of redemption that he planned from the, before the foundation of the world, and now it is time to, uh, to reveal that plan, and it comes in the message of Genesis. And what you're going to see, what you're going to see here, is the nature of God as the sovereign Lord over the universe. As he moves all things to establish his will. And what, what you see is that as the book is as we read through Genesis, as we travel through this book, this first book of the Bible, what you're going to see is how God reveals himself and does things, says things, things take place, things happen because he is moving history forward as he's going to accomplish the plan of redemption to save people from their sins. 
and it's going this book is going to provide that foundational instructional literature that's going to provide the foundation and the basis for the covenant law that's going to be given to the people of Israel that's going to be revealed um, in its covenant stipulations through the books of Exodus to Deuteronomy. And when you're in Exodus and Deuteronomy, they're going to be making references back to Genesis. So this is the foundational book where God is going to tell us how he's going to save humanity from their sins. How he's going to bring in a savior, a redeemer, to save, to save us from our sins. But it all starts with creation. It all starts with creation. And next time, in our next lesson, we're going to begin looking at the details of Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1 and 2 the first couple of verses, and we're going to begin to look at that. And, and so uh, we're going to work our way over the next few lessons, just in Genesis 1, chapter 2, verse 3, the, the creation narrative. And um, just I want to get a foundation set up for us as we go through this book. But this kind of gives you an overview of the book, gives you kind of a broad scope of the book, kind of what's happening here, what's going on, what's taking place. And so take a look, remember at the YouTube description, the links are there for you. And um, so welcome to the journey. We're going to go on this journey through the book of Genesis and, and look at all of this book and see what God is going to reveal to us. And I think it's going to be very, very wonderful. Okay, let me pray. Dear God, we do thank you for this time to look at your word as we begin looking at the book of Genesis and begin to prepare ourselves through the book. And so, Lord, as uh, we begin this journey, we pray you would open our eyes to understanding your truth. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, for next time, uh, maybe read through Genesis 1-1 to 2-3. Read through that section to prepare your heart for the next lesson. And, um, and so, take care. God's blessings. And share this with others. Tell others about the Inductive Journey series. This is something new, getting started doing, and uh, and so uh, when I preach sermons, I take some extra time and and I record a lesson, and so I'm about ready to preach from the book of Matthew. No, sorry, book of Psalms, and going to be preaching from Psalms and uh, today, and so um, but anyway, take care, God's blessings. We'll see you in the next lesson.